returned to the Crescent City nine years after Hurricane Katrina. And then... I was living that dream. A startling confession from a former Miss America. It was probably the loneliest time in my life. Plus, best-selling author Lisa Turkhurst on today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. America, watch your back. The same thugs who beheaded Christians in Iraq now want to bring their reign of terror to the good old USA. And to make matters worse, our own citizens may be the ones planning the attack. Hundreds of Americans have joined the ISIS fighters. So far, only two have been killed. The rest? Well, they're getting battle trained overseas, and they could be coming home to bring their murderous brand of jihad to our own soil. Mark Martin has the story. U.S. leaders say they're using every tool to convince U.S. citizens not to travel overseas to become jihadists. More than 100 Americans are believed to be fighting for ISIS and other militant groups in Syria. Their increasing strength is being compared to al-Qaeda leading up to the 9-11 attacks. They may have again a place to organize a major attack on the United States. And that's very serious. ISIS uh, presents the greatest threat that we've seen since 9-11. Overall, thousands of Westerners have joined the fighting in Iraq and Syria on the side of ISIS. House Homeland Security Chair Congressman Michael McCall says keeping the fighting overseas through military pressure and political reform is crucial. They are true jihadists, but they have greater access to Turkey, Western Europe. They have legal travel documents. Some of them have already traveled to the United States. I am back, one a suicide bomber. Intelligence officials and myself are very concerned uh, about an imminent attack that could happen in the United States if we don't stop them overseas. Earlier this summer, the Syrian al-Qaeda group said an American from Florida carried out a suicide bomb attack for them. He released this threatening video against the United States. You think you are safe? You are not safe. Meanwhile, a desperate mother appeals to ISIS jihadists to free her kidnapped son, another American journalist, Stephen Sotloff. Please release my child. President Obama authorized surveillance flights over Syria. U.S. officials say they need more information before launching airstrikes against ISIS headquarters there. The terrorist group has been gaining ground in Iraq and Syria, and now with the aid of American jihadists. The question is not if ISIS is a threat to the United States, but how great of a threat to the American home front. Mark Martin, CBN News. Well, our CBN News terrorism analyst, Eric Stackelbeck, is with us. Eric, the president said they were the JV team, this ISIS. What, what are they? Well, Pat, they are the most powerful and most dangerous Islamic terrorist group in the world, and they are an imminent threat to the United States, Pat. Up to 300 Americans have traveled to Syria, according to U.S. intelligence officials, to join up with this group. And, Pat, if they don't blow themselves up in Syria, one day, the fear is they will return here. And when these guys come back to the United States, Pat, they're not going to get a job at a gas station or go back to school and get their bachelor's degree. They will be here to establish a sleeper cell to strike on American soil. We have some 3,000 Westerners who've traveled to Syria and Iraq to join this group. And by the way, these Western passport holders do not need a visa to come to the United States. And we also have the small matter, Pat, of that poorest southern border, which I can mm. assure you ISIS is looking at with eyes wide open. Eric, uh, Terry and I were talking before the show. What is it that motivates these people? These are Americans. They grew up there. The other, some of them were Britons. I mean, the one that took the head of that guy off is a Brit. I mean, he grew up in Great Britain, in England. They enjoyed all the privileges of a free society. What motivates these guys? But I think if you have a, a dark side to you and you're looking for the darkest thing there is, there is nothing darker than jihad in this day and age. I'll give you an example. This American who was just killed, U.S. citizen, killed fighting alongside uh, ISIS this week. He was a guy, Pat, who was a drifter who apparently had no direction in life converted to Islam. All of a sudden, he found meaning in the global jihad, these charismatic clerics, these radical imams. And... ISIS in particular, Pat, is very adept at using YouTube, using social media to recruit these charismatic imams, tell these misguided souls 
throughout the world that if you join the jihad, you will be a part of something big. You will matter. And the United States that has kept you down, that has oppressed you, you can strike back against. I think another wrinkle here is with this younger generation, Pat, they call it jihadi cool, if you can believe that. They blend hip-hop culture, rap music, with jihad in these YouTube videos, on Facebook, on Twitter, and that becomes very attractive to these twisted young people, many of them, Pat, who grew up playing these violent video games. They mm. go over there, they think beheading is, is a cool thing. We don't, they've got so much money, too. I understand they picked up a bank in Mosul, got a lot of money there, but are they collecting taxes for these areas that they're in charge of, or is it oil revenue? Where are they getting their money? Pat, it's a combination. First of all, they are collecting taxes under Sharia law in the areas they control, especially under non-Muslims. Either you pay an exorbitant tax, you convert, or you die. That's the choices ISIS is laying out to Christians in the Middle East. In terms of their funding, they're getting local funding and global funding. That's what makes them so dangerous on the local level, Pat. They have conquered some oil fields in northern Iraq and Syria, and what they're doing is they're selling that crude oil on the black market throughout the Middle East in places like Turkey, Iran, Syria. So they're making up to $2 million a day in that illicit oil trade, according to some reports. Also, they have ransoms, kidnappings. We saw, unfortunately, James Foley beheaded last week. Some Europeans who they've captured, Pat, uh, the European countries have paid high ransoms to get their citizens back. That's another way. And as you mentioned, the banks. When they conquer the bank in Mosul, Iraq, they seized some $500 million in assets. This is, we've never seen a richer terrorist organization. This is not just a terrorist group. This is a terrorist army. Real quick here, Pat, also, when it comes to global funding, wealthy private donors in places like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Kuwait, supposed U.S. allies are also pouring money into ISIS. Uh, one last question. Uh, the Obama administration, you know, Senator McCain says they're feckless. They didn't pick up the clues to what this organization was. How about now? General Dempsey said, if we're going to crush it, we've got to, go, we've got to hit Syria. Is the administration going to do what they need, they need to do? You know, Pat, that's a great question, because last week, Chuck Hagel, Hagel the defense secretary and the Joint Chiefs, uh, Martin Dempsey, said, look, this is an imminent threat. They must be defeated now. Then over the weekend, they kind of changed their tune and said, look, it's more of a regional threat, not an imminent threat to the United States. Yesterday, the press secretary, Josh Earnest, the White House press secretary, when he was pressed on whether President Obama wants to defeat ISIS, he was asked, Pat, in two or three different ways, he couldn't answer. Then at the end, he said, oh, of course we want to defeat ISIS. So it's unclear right now. President Obama is discussing and discussing some more about what he wants to do about this group. I do think, Pat, if you really want to smash ISIS, and we need to smash them before they strike here, Syria is where their stronghold is, particularly the city of Raqqa in eastern Syria. But I don't know that you can do it with air power alone. Eric, thank you so much. Stay with it. We appreciate you, your Pat. insightful analysis. God bless you. Eric Stackelbeck, our terrorism analyst. Uh, you know, General MacArthur said something so cogent. In war, there's no substitute for victory. There's no substitute for victory. You either win or you don't. And we, we, you can't fight a war half-heartedly. These mm -hmm. people are out to destroy us, and they're well-funded, and they're getting support every day. It's increasing. And we've got to strike them now. We didn't strike in Syria when we should have. They, they wouldn't have gotten going if we'd moved in. And Terry, we, we're not doing what we need to do. Well, this is sort of, we're kind of at a crossroads here with all of this. We've got a vulnerable northern border with people talking about what's established in Canada already, That's a vulnerable true. southern border. I mean, it needs to be now. Well, we do something with these homegrown jihadis are going to be blowing up. It doesn't take much to set a bomb off on a train station. It doesn't take much to blow somebody up. And a lot of uh, uh, C4 or something like that, you can melt a pretty good, uh, effective bomb, and you can get stuff now through without too much trouble. You know, I spent a lot of time last night. I, I wasn't sleeping too well. The Bible says in the de last days, uh, and it's in, in um, uh, Isaiah, that Assyria is going to go 
and join with Egypt, and they will be with Israel a third in the land. And there's going to be a highway, and God's going to look at all of them as His people. Now, Assyria doesn't exist anymore. It mm -hmm. fell apart. But what is Assyria? It is Iraq and Syria. And ISIS is bringing Iraq and Syria together. But who is the linchpin that would be, you know, play nice? And that's the Kurds. The Kurds have people all over. And I think, you know, it, it may seem like a pipe dream, but if I was sitting down with a group of people like, you know, the Peacock Sykes group to determine what's going to be the Middle East, I would say let's give the Kurds, let's pick up the Kurds in Iran, pick up the Kurds in Turkey, pick up the Kurds in Syria, pick up the Kurds in Iraq, and call it Assyria, mm -hmm. and let them encompass current Syria and current Iraq, and we would be fulfilling Bible prophecy. And it may well happen. You know, it's one of those things. We mark my word. I say, mm -hmm. was that prophetic, or I'm just uh, playing games? Well, but, Bible prophecy is often like that. You look at it and say, how can this be? And then well, that's, 10, 15 see, years later, Egypt you think, defeated how did we get the, here? The, the, the Brotherhood. And, uh, but America, Obama and this crew won't. Back Sisi in Egypt. Egypt is our friend now. They want to play with us. The Muslim Brotherhood hated us. But we've played with the Brotherhood and said, these are our allies. They were, they were radicals. They founded Hamas. They founded the PLO. They founded the Hezbollah. And uh, what are we doing? We haven't embraced the people in Egypt who want to be our friends. So. The Saudis and others are, but not the United States. We have just, it's no plan in that organization. It drives you crazy. <laughs> okay. Try you know, melatonin. It, well, melatonin <laughs> I take. But I, I'm up drawing the map of the Middle East. I don't know what to say. All right. Well, in other news, the president of Ukraine says Russia has invaded his country. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. Here's John. Pat, President Poroshenko called an emergency meeting of Ukraine's Security Council today as concerns grow that a new battlefront has begun with Russia and Ukraine. This comes after Russian-supported separatists firmly gain control of a strategic Ukrainian town. Officials believe the rebels are trying to use Novozovsk to create a land link between Russia and the Crimean Peninsula. It would also give Russia control over the gas and mineral riches in the Sea of Azov. The move could yield more sanctions from the U.S. and European Union. Pat, this comes on top of already imposed sanctions that appear to be bringing Russia closer to recession. Oh, that's baloney. The, the sanctions, I mean, Putin's laughing at sanctions. He's got a lock at home, and he doesn't care about sanctions. What he knows, he's going to grow a, a greater Russia. There, there was a very insightful article, George Shultz, uh, Secretary of State, and uh, what is it, William Perry, I believe, uh, Secretary of Defense with, uh, uh, but who was it? Uh, I guess, uh, was it Carter or was it uh, uh, Clinton? Well, anyhow, uh, they had a, a joint article, and they said, we've got to come to defense of, of uh, the Ukraine. There was a deal signed with Russia that said, okay, we're going to acknowledge the sovereignty of the Ukraine. Russia will not invade and will not uh, trample on the sovereignty of the Ukraine. As a result of that, the, the Ukrainians gave up, I think it was close to 1,800 nuclear uh, wow. weapons they had because they said this will protect us. Now, Russia has violated that treaty as if it wasn't even there. And all we're talking about is mild sanctions about some oligarchs. We've got to send military uh, equipment right now. We ought to take a squadron of our latest jets and put them over there in an airfield in uh, uh, Ukraine and say, listen, this is a key ally. You will not invade. We are not just before World War II. We're not going to allow one nation to invade the sovereignty uh, territory of another. But we're sitting by and they say, well, we're considering sanctions. Please. John. Pat, here at home, a new government report says the federal debt will keep growing rapidly in the years ahead. The Congressional Budget Office projects the government will keep running deficits over the next decade, adding more than $7 trillion to the national debt. That would bring the federal debt to nearly $25 trillion. The CBO adds health care and retirement programs will drive up government spending. And Pat, that could certainly mean higher taxes in the years ahead. Well, there's no question we're going to pay higher taxes. Uh, you know, uh, my 
good friend, Dave Thomas. He was a buddy. He was a terrific guy. He loved hamburgers. He ate too many hamburgers, and he was the CEO of Wendy's. And they bought a company called Tim Horton in Canada. And I said to Dave, is that a good investment? He said, of course it is. And I said, well, it didn't sound like, you know, donuts are a good investment to me. Well, in any event, somewhere along the way, uh, an advisor talked them out of selling it. And so uh, Wendy's sold Tim Horton and Tim Horton's back on the market. And so now uh, Burger King, which has been struggling somewhat along the way, has decided it's going to buy Tim Horton. So uh, they're going to do an inversion where Tim Horton will become the successor company and be headquartered in Canada as in, in as opposed to wherever Burger King is mm -hmm. in Illinois or whatever. I was paraphrasing a judge and a good friend down in North Carolina was kind enough to send the actual quote from the uh, Federal Register of the Second Circuit. Judge Learned Hand was one of the most distinguished uh, jurists in America. He sat on the Second Circuit, and this is a decision he made I guess it's, they called it obiter. Uh, he was just, it wasn't the key of the case, but he's writing in it. And I want to get the exact quote, because for anybody to say Burger King is unpatriotic or they're, they're evil, or, and one senator from Illinois wants to organize a uh, boycott against Burger King and all this nonsense, here's what Judge Hand said, and read it, Mr. Obama. You were supposed to be a tax law, uh, professor. I doubt it very seriously. Quote, anyone may arrange his affairs so that his taxes shall be as low as possible. He is not bound to choose that pattern which best pays the treasury. There is not even a patriotic duty to increase one's taxes over and over again. The courts have said that there is nothing sinister in so arranging affairs as to keep taxes as low as possible. Everybody does it, rich and poor alike, and all do right, for nobody owes any public duty to pay more than the law demands. Now that's Second Circuit Judge Learned Hands. We have no obligation, and if they don't like the law, they can change it. But the law permits these inversions, and it permits certain things, and it permits companies operating in foreign jurisdictions to keep their money overseas until they repatriate it. That's the law. And if they repay it, they'll pay draconian taxes. So they've allowed trillions of dollars to build up in accounts overseas that could come home if we just lower taxes. But there is no patriotic duty to pay more than you're supposed to pay. If the Congress doesn't like what they've done, they can change the law. But that's the law. And so... <clears throat> I don't know about donut shops. I wouldn't buy a donut shop. It was the last one in the world. But anyhow, well, Tim Maybe you better wait and see how the dust settles on this. <laughs> you might want a donut shop or two. <laughs> okay, well, whatever. But anyhow, Burger King has got a deal going. And we shouldn't be calling them tax cheats and all the rest of it because that's just not the way, the way it is. So in any event, um, I mean, if we really want to cut this federal deficit, it's counterintuitive, but it's the way we ought to do it. We need to cut the corporate tax right away. We ought to make it easier for businesses to get formed in America. We ought to take away the incredible amount of uh, regulations that are holding down our economy. And we ought to let the great engine of American uh, entrepreneurship come free. And if we do, we won't have any problem. Okay, John. Pat, it's a summer rite of passage when parents and students commence the annual back-to-school shopping trip. Unfortunately, many kids will return to class empty-handed because their families just can't afford the necessary supplies. But that's not the case for students at one Virginia school. And as Charlene Abram reports, it's all thanks to CBN's Orphan's Promise. It was an end of summer celebration at PB Young Elementary School in Norfolk, Virginia, complete with hot dogs, chips, and drinks. This indoor picnic is the latest in an ongoing partnership between CBN's Orphan's Promise and the school, located in one of Virginia's poorest neighborhoods. In December, Orphan's Promise helped to keep nearly 500 students here warm with coats, hats, scarves, and gloves, but the needs keep growing. The students here at PB Young Elementary School are excited about the start of a new school year, and CBN's Orphans Promise is making sure they have the tools they need to succeed. 
We are so excited to be back with you because we had so much fun with you at Christmas time. We just couldn't stay away. After the, the party, almost 300 students attending summer school classes got a back to school surprise. Backpacks filled with supplies provided by Orphans Promise and Walmart. <laughs> Education changes the lives of children. That's why we're here at PB Young. It's why we believe in what's happening here today. Let's get them excited about education and give them a heart to start a new year, fresh, new process, and see what God has for them. I got color pencils, and I got a ruler, and erasers, and two notebooks. The school's principal says this love and support instills hope and gives students a sense of stability. They have people in their lives that constantly come and go, so it's so nice to know that you know we can depend on an organization like CBN, so that's just been awesome. Teachers agree. All of our children are poverty level children. Um, many of them have nothing. And so it's, you know, and, or the parents work very hard, but they don't have the money to buy their children supplies. So a lot of these children come to school without supplies. Um, they don't have pencils, they don't have erasers, they don't have uh, scissors or paper or notebooks. If a child has a backpack, they feel empowered. So while most kids dread the thought of summer's end, Students at PB Young can look forward to the new school year, armed with everything they need to hit the books. Thank you for giving me all the supplies. Thank you, Orphan Farm. Thank you. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. CBN's Orphan's Promise making a positive impact on children's lives. Pat, Terry, Thank back you. to you. Terry, oh, what a joy. Those little children are so sweet, and they, they are so grateful for what you did. Well, do you remember when it was time to go back to school? Yeah, Part of yeah. the excitement, you know, was getting the stuff together. Not and sure. so we, these kids were all kids who participated in the school summer school program, and we really wanted to encourage them in their education and to say, get ready, the big day's mm. coming. Walmart helped us with all of this as well. And so we had a great marriage between Walmart and CBN's Orphan's Promise, oh, and the great. school there is awesome. So back to school, kids, with gusto and enthusiasm. How many students did you help? Well, there are 500 kids at the 500 school. 500 you could supply them. And now everyone. the school, we're going to get involved, I think, with another school down there. These are areas where the parents are wanting their kids to sure. have what they need and just can't get it for them. So well, we want to encourage marvelous. families. Who knows what champions will come out of that Precisely. experience? Precisely. It Precisely. Really I mean, this is, That's it. This is the, 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 the f stuff of the future. Mm -hmm. you know? Terry, congratulations. Orphan's Promise, ladies and gentlemen, is something you can help when you, when you give to CBN. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the things that we do is Terry's wonderful program, Orphan's Promise, is funded by CBN. Absolutely. Terry. Well, coming up, nine years after Katrina, New Orleans is back, and the residents who weathered that storm would have it no other way. I love this city, I love everything about it, and it's always nice to clean up your closet and start again. We'll head back to the Big Easy. That's coming up next. Guess where this is happening. With Sharia patrols in the streets and nine-year-old girls getting married. This stuff is coming directly from the Quran. The answer may surprise you, and then, I'm sorry to tell you that looks like your son might have autism. A son who couldn't speak rises to the top of his class. God did the miraculous in Ethan's life. On tomorrow's 700 Club. Well, nine years ago, something big happened in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, Hurricane Katrina hit a Category 5, and then a day later, it slowed down to a Category 3, and then it plowed into New Orleans. So today is the day, we, the anniversary of the reaching Category 5. And people across the Gulf braced themselves for a direct hit. Days later, the city of New Orleans was submerged and as Jennifer Wishon reports, it's fought its way back. 
<laughs> Monique Fauché loves teaching people how to swim. She offers private lessons at her home and teaches for free in the city to those who can't afford it. This is her inspiration. Half of the bodies they found were from drowning because a lot of people did not know how to swim. When Katrina flooded the city, Voshe, her sister, and parents lost everything. As much as it took everything away, it gave me a whole new start. And a new purpose. The parents don't want their kids to, have to drown, or they're just so afraid because so many people have drowned around them that they instill that fear. I'm doing it! You're doing it! I think it's important for everybody here to swim. I mean, fishbowl. <laughs> no matter where you go, you're going to find water, whether it's the river right here, uh, the massive Lake Pontchartrain to our north, uh, the open waters of the Gulf to our south. We are surrounded by water. When Katrina hit, Poche says New Orleans was operating with a partial levee system at best. Improvements were on the books, but many left unfinished, awaiting federal funding. For the past nine years, the Army Corps of Engineers has worked full time fortifying the city. Levees and flood walls have been reinforced or added to the city's 133 mile perimeter, along with the 350 mile network of interior flood walls and levees. Here's one of the remaining projects. It's one of three new storm surge barriers complete with its own power source and super pumps designed to pull water out of the city into Lake Pontchartrain during a storm. It'll fill an Olympic sized swimming pool in about four seconds. The work is 99% complete and expected to be finished by the end of 2016. So the big question after all this work and 14 and a half billion tax dollars, is New Orleans storm ready? The system would be challenged uh, at a Katrina type storm, but it would perform as designed. There may be some interior flooding. Again, it's a kind of speculation as to what might happen inside the system. For tourists, the city is as good as new, maybe even better. The famous French Quarter is vibrant and once again a top travel destination. The New Orleans Saints Superdome, a shelter for refugees after the storm, restored as a crown jewel to the city's skyline. There are more hotel rooms and nearly two times the number of restaurants than before the storm. But look closer past the tourist hubs and scars are still very visible. Here in the Lower Ninth Ward, a community center tells the story, a makeshift map showing where residents retreated and an accounting of the many who never came back. Stephen Robinson estimates at least 50 people from his neighborhood stayed away. Their decayed houses all boarded up. When we decided to come back here, it was, ooh, it was just devastating for my wife and man for me. We had just got through renovating our home. It's been right at $100,000 renovation and four months later, here come Katrina wiped us out. The overgrown lots, some barely mowed in nearly a decade, could soon be occupied again. State lawmakers passed a plan to let local residents buy abandoned lots for $100. It's now before Louisiana voters. Meanwhile, volunteers from across the globe still come to help people rebuild. With some of the volunteers. They're working on Robinson's father's house. Construction was delayed after he fell victim to contract fraud. Things could have been done a lot differently. Roads still need to be repaired. Restaurants and stores that once dotted the community, he says never came back. Before the storm, 25 churches served the community. Now many are lifeless, left to the elements, abandoned by their congregations. Governor Bobby Jindal inherited Katrina's mess. How confident are you, nearly a decade since Katrina hit New Orleans, that the city is prepared to weather the next storm? The hurricane flood walls, the levees, the protection is better than it's been uh, ever before. You can never build a wall that's going to keep out the water and the hurricanes forever. Once the levees and flood walls are complete, the Army Corps of Engineers will focus on coastal restoration, another expensive project to prevent flooding. Our people are resilient and they keep bouncing back after storm after storm. People who returned consider each other family. I love the city, I love everything about it, and I think the people here are so unique and great 
It's always nice to clean up your closet and start again. There's no place like New Orleans for me. Now other people, yeah, and I have a lot of friends say, why did I come back? And why, you know, what do you see down there? There's nothing down there. Yes, it is. It's something. Now, now I'm down here. That makes the difference. In Louisiana, some say hurricanes are the cost of living in paradise. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, New Orleans. The cost of living in paradise. We were there very quickly on the scene with Operation mm -hmm. Blessing. We stayed there for, I think, well over a year. Uh, I personally uh, worked on one house that that mold was so bad, even though I was having a mask, the, the headache came very quickly. The, the mold was terrible. And uh, uh, we were feeding people at one time, I think as many as 35,000 meals a day in conjunction with the Salvation Army on one, one uh, station. Mm -hmm. They had nothing. Yeah. Well, that that uh, moisture down there that's awesome. constantly yeah. in the air, that mold forms like that when you've got that kind of water well, problem. I, the, the suffering. And mm. I tell you, I, I flew in a helicopter over the whole yeah. thing of the devastation. Some of those houses looked like they'd been blown apart with a, with a explosion, just mm -hmm. little sticks. Uh, but they're resilient. I tell you, the yeah. nicest people, they're so friendly. And it's just that you go to the, the places and the restaurants, they're so cordial and so friendly. And uh, I tell you, the, the, they're resilient people, and God bless them. Okay. Exactly. You have to say hats All off right. to New Orleans. Well, if you've ever felt overwhelmed and exhausted, stick around because Lisa Turkhurst is here and will show you how to survive. And then later, a woman who knows a thing or two about being busy and surviving, Lauren Nelson, reflects on her year as Miss America. Have you ever been in a situation where you just can't say no and you don't want to say yes? Well, if so, you are not alone. But here's the good news. You don't have to say yes or no, because according to Lisa Turkers, there's a third option. Many women struggle with what some call the disease to please. They always say yes to endless demands when what they want to say is no. New York Times best-selling author and president of Proverbs 31 Ministries, Lisa Turkers, says there's a big difference between saying yes to everyone and saying yes to God. In her book, The Best Yes, Lisa encourages women to live a less stressful life by learning how to use those two powerful words. Lisa Turkhurst is here with us now. And Lisa, welcome back to the 700 Club. Well, thank you. It's so fun to be here. You've got a great new book, The Best Yes. What do you mean by that? Well, I think if we can better identify in our life what we want our lives to look like. And I know for me, so many times when I set my life to the rhythm of rush, I don't like who I am. I'm with you. And so I want to empower women or empower anyone that reads this book. Mm -hmm. The best, yes, is identifying what we want our life to look like. And once we identify that and identify where we really feel God calling us and what kind of family does he want us to have, what does, what does he want us to be accomplishing each day, then we can back up. And when we use the two most powerful words, yes and no, we've already identified identified our best yes answers. Mm -hmm. And so it makes it easier to use those words. Here's something that I think is a challenge for people. You say in your book, we must not confuse the command to love with the disease to please. Mm. And I think the confusion comes in, how do you know the difference between those two things? Well, when Jesus called us to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, and soul, and to love other people, I really think that he calls us to pay attention in how we can demonstrate that attitude of love all throughout our day. I think a lot of times we want these big directional signs from God, like, God, what is your will for our life? God just wants us to pay attention. But I know when I am caught up in the disease to please and I'm saying yes to too much, it doesn't make me Wonder Woman, it makes me a worn out woman. And it, it leaves you with a just a weighty feeling in your heart. When I've done that too and I understand what you're saying. What do you do when you've said what you know is the right response to someone, whether it's yes or no, and they're offended by the mm -hmm. choice that you've made? Well, if you say no to someone and they're offended because you've said no, then they're eventually going to be offended 
disappointed even if you say yes to this. So you <laughs> might as well go ahead <laughs> and experience the disappointment, but keeping your life in a place. I, I wrote in The Best Yes, when a woman lives with the stress of an overwhelmed schedule, she'll ache with the sadness of an underwhelmed soul. Yeah. And so overwhelmed schedule equals underwhelmed soul. We've got to flip that. And if we can, I'm hoping that The Best Yes can enter into conversations in spheres of, of girlfriends and in uh, mm -hmm. groups of Bible studies and book clubs, and everyone can start using this language so it's not so offensive when we have to say no to something. Yeah. What are some of the things, Lisa, that you consider when you're making the decision about what you should or should not do or get involved in or whatever? Okay, so if someone makes a request of me and I instantly feel dread, <laughs> like it might feel good to say yes in the moment, but as I write it yeah. on my schedule, I feel dread. If I know my disappointment is gonna be pointed in the wrong direction, mm. like I may, I may please this person, but then I'm gonna carry the weight of disappointing someone else. Yes. And a lot of times, unfortunately, that's my family. And so that dread, that disappointment or drama, I know it's gonna set the pace of my life where things are gonna feel very mm -hmm. uh, drama filled. So dread, disappointment, drama, if that's what I'm feeling as I'm writing yeah. something on my schedule, it's time to back up and really say, you know what, Terry, I would absolutely love to do it. My heart says yes, 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 but the reality of my time makes this a no. Yeah. You have lots of wise counsel in your book, but one of the things you say is that wisdom needs to be practiced. What yes. do you mean by that? Well, I believe that if we want to be known as wise women, we've mm -hmm. got to tuck wisdom in the sacred spaces of our life. Yeah. In other words, we've got to tuck wisdom in the things we say and in the things we don't say. We've got to tuck wisdom in the things we do and the things we don't do. We've got to tuck wisdom in the places we go and the places we don't go. And as we daily tuck little pieces of wisdom, and what I mean by that is really taking God's word. And in Philippians, it talks about how knowledge leads to insight, insight leads to discernment. Mm -hmm. So we've got to get knowledge from acquiring the truth, insight by applying that truth, and discernment by listening to the Holy Spirit reminders as we make decisions. Yeah. You can't wait until the moment that the answer is required. It seems to me like you're talking about really very intentionally evaluating your life, the call of God upon your life, yes. and everything that lies before you. You know, a lot of times, Terry, I, I would catch myself saying, I want to serve God in that way when I find more time or make more time. <laughs> but here's the reality. No one in the history of the world has ever found more or made more time, right? Yeah. We have 168 hours a week. So we've got to get proactive about making sure if you know God is calling you to do this assignment, then you've got to mark out on your schedule, this is an appointment with God and I'm not going to let anything else mm -hmm. interfere with that. Boy. It's so important. Yeah. Tell us, if you will, as quickly as you can, the story of the high jumper that you talk about in your book, because sometimes it requires changing our methodology, right? The changing direction. Changing our yeah. approach. That's mm -hmm. right. So I saw a commercial um, on TV about Dick Fosbury and how he set new records in the high jump by changing the way that he approached the high jump. He twisted his body in a different direction. And I was so inspired by that. I have a daughter who is a pole vaulter, oh. and so I've watched her have to apply this. And mm -hmm. what inspired me so much about my daughter is every day she showed up to practice because she wanted to be a pole vaulter. That's the same with me. I've got to show up every day, let God's yeah. word get into me as I get into God's word, and practice using God's word to help me yeah. utilize the two most powerful words more effectively, mm -hmm. yes, and no. and no. I really highly recommend Lisa's book to all of you. I'll tell you, in the world today, we are so caught up with things pulling us this way and that. The world is noisy, life is messy. You gotta find ways to grab hold of that and live life intentionally. You can get more of Lisa's insights by getting her book. It's called The Best Yes. That's easy to remember, isn't it? It's available in stores nationwide. Thank you so much. Oh. What a wise word you bring us in the midst of the chaos. Thank you. <laughs> it's great to have you here. Well, Lisa encouraged us to choose the best yes, but for some people that may not seem like an option. The women who wear the Miss America crown get whisked away on a year-long marathon, spend every other day in a different city, and log more than 20,000 travel miles every month. So it's no surprise after Lauren Nelson won the crown in 2007, she said it was a dream come true and one she desperately wanted to wake up from.
The new Miss America is Miss Oklahoma Lauren Nelson. So exciting. Because I had worked so hard for this goal and for this dream, but so scary at the same time. I had set it as my goal and I wanted it and I wanted to be Miss America, and I was living that dream. Lauren Nelson was raised in Lawton, Oklahoma, where she lived a simple life with her family. In school, she developed a knack for being on stage. Performing with show choir or musicals, I loved that kind of rush of just like live performance. For Lauren, the stage gave her a place to shine. I always wanted to be the popular kid. I wanted people to like me. And so I think I, I did a lot base my confidence if people were like happy with me or not happy with me. She never thought about being in beauty pageants until high school when some friends talked her into entering one. I thought, okay, well, it's a place for me to get to sing. I, maybe I could win a little money for college. Pageants definitely feed your ego. I mean, especially after you've won a title and then, it, you know, there's a circle of people that make it all about you. You know, just people saying, yeah, you're gonna win and, you know, you're the best. Lauren became Miss Oklahoma and set her sights on the Miss America title. I found my total identity in being Miss Oklahoma. First of all, just being successful at it, that people thought I was good enough. Just to know that people that I didn't know, those judges had judged me all week and thought, okay, she's worthy of that. Lauren's hard work paid off when she won the 2007 Miss America pageant. It was a dream come true, but Lauren soon realized she carried a heavy burden. People wanted to meet Miss America. They didn't really want to know Lauren. And on the outside, it was literally a dream come true. But on the inside, like behind the scenes, it was probably the loneliest time in my life. As the year went on, Lauren began to have a change of heart. When I really started to get to go to children's hospitals and see kids and actually see that Miss America can make like, an impact and can inspire and brighten up somebody's day. Those were the parts that I just, I loved. After her reign ended, Lauren had to prepare for the next phase of her life. The beginning of my year, I was crying because I was too scared to do it. And at the end of it, I was boohooing because I wanted them to ask me to do it another year. I really thought like, what do I do now? What is life after Miss America? Because I'm 21 and I hope I haven't peaked. <laughs> On the flight home, Lauren ran into a reporter, Robin Marsh. Over a cup of coffee, the two started a friendship. In time, Robin spoke to Lauren about Jesus. She invited me to go to church with her and her family. Um, she asked me to do a Bible study in her home with her. I really saw in Robin's life um, her living out this relationship with Jesus. And I saw the, the difference that it made in her life and I thought, I want what they've got, and I need what they've got. That's when Lauren made a decision. I remember going in front of the church just broken. It was that day that I fully surrendered everything to him. That was the day that he took all my shame and all my guilt and that I felt true forgiveness. Today, Lauren is now married and speaks to audiences about her time as Miss America and finding her true identity in Christ. My identity is found in, in who Jesus says I am now, instead of what everybody else thinks of me. Because that opinion changes all the time. But God's opinion of me never changes. If you'd like to know more about the ministry that Lauren Nelson is heading up today, you can go to our website, cbn.com. There's more there. And I uh, just want to also say our phone lines are always open. If something we've talked about on the program today touches your heart and you'd like to pray with someone about it, there's the number, 1-800-759-0700. Hey, you were Miss America. Mm -hmm. Did you have some dark night of the soul where you were wish you were going to die? I had great weariness. <laughs> I bet you did. <laughs> well, it is a crazy, crazy schedule. But I think what Lauren said is when you realize that there is a way for you to do it, um, using the platform you've been given yeah. for good, it makes a difference. Well, yeah. Good for you. I was a little older, too. You were a little, <laughs> you're a little more mature, able to handle. All right. Well, up next, it's time to bring it on. One viewer wants to know, what is the best way to get over past mistakes? Well, we'll take that question and more as we come up after the news.
Welcome back to the 700 Club. A federal judge in Utah has struck down parts of the state's law against polygamy. The case revolves around a lawsuit filed by a polygamous family that appears on the TV show Sister Wives. Cody Brown and his four wives sued Utah three years ago after a county prosecutor threatened to charge them under the state's bigamy law. The federal judge says that a provision in that law violates Brown's freedom of religion. The Utah Attorney General says he will appeal. The Boston Marathon bombing 16 months ago killed three people and injured more than 260. But believe it or not, something great came out of it for one of the victims, James Costello. This past weekend, he married the nurse who helped him recover. A photograph of Costello with his clothes ripped to shreds and part of his body burned became one of the most recognized images of the 2013 attack. He met Krista Agostino while recovering from multiple surgeries for shrapnel injuries and serious burns. The couple married in Boston. There they are. Costello calls Diagnosto his best friend and the love of his life. Congratulations to the happy couple. You can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Well, it's time to bring it on with your email questions. And Pat, this first one comes from a viewer who asks, what is the best method that we as followers of Christ should try to do in order to get over our past? Should we just learn from it and move on? What's the best way to get over our mistakes? Oh, I think you have to be willing to forgive yourself. And you have to, I think I'd outline the mistakes that you've made and say, look, I really screwed up. I did bad things, and uh, I made mistakes, and I asked forgiveness, and I plead the blood of Jesus Christ over them, and I know He's forgiven me, and now I forgive me, and mm -hmm. I, I want to move on. And I think the thing to do is you, you just have to fill your life with other things. If you continually obsess on the fact that you should have sold that stock, or you should have bought something, or you shouldn't have done this, or you should have done the other, you, you ruin yourself. So you've got to stop it. You've got to stop thinking about it. And that's all I can say. You, you need to think about the Lord, think about your friends, think about a new environment, but get something else to do that will occupy your time and your attention. And that stuff will fade away if you will let him. Mm -hmm. This is Ginger who says, Pat, you and others have said you do not like special prosecutors. I'd like to know why you're against them. Well, they get out of control. I mean, once you appoint a special pro prosecutor, he's got a hunting license to go after everybody. And uh, they have enormous budgets and they have big staffs and they set up an office and they park in and then they, they go after everybody. It's just terrible. And they're out of control. They don't report to anybody. Theoretically, they report to the attorney general or someone else, but there's no real line of authority. And they, they're, they're dangerous, very frankly, the special prosecutors. But sometimes you need one. Mm -hmm. Right now, we need one. But uh, I, I, that's why I don't like them, because you don't want any agency that gets out of control. And the special prosecutors uh, become a law to themselves, and they get out of control. Yeah, and the costs exorbitant, oh, as you huge. said. Oh, huge. Millions yeah. and millions of dollars, absolutely. Okay, this is Jason, who says, I want to better understand Hebrews 6. Is it talking about completely turning away from Jesus or sinning after being saved? If that's the case, then we're all in trouble. It's a pretty scary passage. Please clarify. Well, it is scary, and I, I think what uh, essentially it says that if you apostatize, after you've tasted the good things of the Lord, you've tasted the Holy Spirit, uh, you've done all these things, and then suddenly you turn and, and renounce Christianity, renounce Jesus, turn completely away from it, and renounce that, then he said, you know, there's no hope. But then right after it, he says, but I'm persuaded better things about you. Uh, there's nothing in, in that passage that said it's going to happen to you. He said, I'm persuaded better things about you. You're not, you didn't do it, and you're not going to do it. And I, I think he's talking about complete apostasy, complete uh, renunciation of your faith. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you're talking, it's, it's happened to me or you. 
Right. Okay, this is a viewer who says, my pastor recently said he did not believe the devil could put thoughts in your head because he couldn't find it in the Bible. He was using the scripture where when we sin, it's because of our own evil desires. I really don't understand this statement. How else could the devil work? Your thoughts on this, please. Oh, um, you know, these pastors, apparently they don't read the whole Bible. Uh, there's something called the temptation of Christ where he's out, he's been fasting, he's out alone in the wilderness, and the devil comes to him, and he says, if you are the Son of God, make these stones turn into bread. If you are the Son of God, jump off this building. If you are the Son of God, and so forth. Mm -hmm. I mean, where's that? It's the devil putting thoughts in his mind. Uh, you can't find that in the Bible. It's about as clear as anything in the world. Of course it's in the Bible. Of course the devil can put thoughts into your mind. And uh, well, That's why we're told to put on the full armor, right? He said the devil is like a roaring lion going about seeking whom he may my will to devour. And, you know, put on the whole armor of God. That's right. You know, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, all that that you may overcome all the works of the devil. That, that preacher, he shouldn't, I don't think, be preaching if he does. Ask him to go back to seminary for a year or two <laughs> and then, then, then get back to the pulpit, okay? Okay. This is Michelle who says, I'm single, 44 years old, and have never been married. I'm so hurt and lonely and think about marriage every day, or at least having a companion. I've been reading books on marriage. One said that God has a sovereign will and that we make moral decisions in his moral will. Obviously, the author who wrote the book is a Bible scholar. That means that it is up to me to do things to get married. So what do I do? Go on Match.com? Or is God really bringing that person to me? I really want to be married. Can I just pray for a husband? Is that possible, or is there some trick to the whole thing? There isn't anything that will drive a man away faster than a woman who is just desperate to be married. Uh, you're guaranteeing you ain't going to have the answer. So let me suggest that you have a happy life, that you have a fulfilled, rewarding life, mm -hmm. and that you're just full of bubbling over with joy and peace, and some man will come along and say, man, you are so attractive. I think you would make me a nice life partner. And of course, go out where people are. You, you, you know, you fish where the fish are. And, uh, you know, <laughs> so. The good fish. The good fish, <laughs> and not the bad fish. Don't go to some sleazy bar looking to hook up. But, you know, they've got this Christian mingle and these other things, uh, by all means. but. Get over that desperation. Yes. That is a sure turn off. Okay. Well, we leave you with today's Power Minute from Matthew 11:28. Come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Tomorrow, jihadists are on patrol looking for violators of Sharia law. This may surprise you. That's Friday on the 700 Club. Bye-bye.